Lonnie is a, a sought-after speaker. Uh, he is, as I said, no stranger to us. I believe he did our, our homecoming in 2008. I think it was in 2005 or 6, I'm not real sure which. He did a marriage seminar for us one weekend. Did a tremendous job with both of those. I always love hearing Lonnie. The way Lonnie presents a lesson uh, is unique and very dynamic. And I want to tell you that you will not be disappointed for being here that night. You won't be disappointed for being here any night. But Lonnie's going to do a wonderful job for us. And I ask that you begin now by praying for all of those. I appreciate so much Milton's prayer uh, as he prays for our campaign. And don't forget, with this in mind, we're just a few short weeks away now from March the 9th. This is when we'll have our special contribution toward this evangelistic effort. What wonderful way for us to invest our money then back into the kingdom of God. What wonderful way for us to use the money that God has blessed us with than to put forth toward an effort that might just win one soul. We're looking forward to this campaign. We're praying about this campaign. Our hope and our goal is to raise at least $50,000. As you can see on the screen behind me, we've already raised over $28,000 toward this endeavor. Now, those $28,000, as I shared with you last Sunday morning, that's just on three individual contributions. So we look forward to what the rest of us as a congregation can be praying about and planning for to put forward toward this wonderful, wonderful effort. If you're like me, then for many of us, national security, when it comes to our country, it is a pretty big deal. National security is, is something that regardless uh, of the administration, regardless of who might be in the, the office of president in that moment in time, national security is something that seemingly should always be at the top of their priority list because we want to know we want to know that we are guarded. We want to know that we are protected. All I need is a red light, guys. <coughs> Let me see if I can change the battery. I guess y'all can just talk amongst yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if this works any better. Better to learn early than later, I guess. You know, as I said, national security can be and should be of the, the utmost importance. But you know what? No matter how great our national security may be, our government cannot protect us from the one who does the most harm to us. Do you know, do you want to know, who provides me the most heartache in this life? Well, would you like to know who causes me the most turmoil, the most pain? Would, would you like to know who brings about the most restless nights in my life as a result of, well, life situations? I bet you'd like to know, wouldn't you? It's me. It's me. In this life, I am my own worst enemy. And so are you. And if you don't think that you are today, then I would dare say that you have a pride problem. We're not talking about pride today. That's a sermon, I guess, for another day and another time. One of the biggest lies that we so often listen to and believe is that the devil made me do it. Church, I want you to know this morning the devil doesn't make you do anything. Sure, the devil puts things in front of us. He tempts us to do things that we know we ought not do. But he cannot make us do those things we choose. We choose to do the very things that we know we ought not do. And so oftentimes then, these life messes that we so often find ourselves in are as a result of our own actions, our own behavior, our own choices. So you say, why would we do that? I mean, what would, what would cause a man or a woman to make such bad choices that bring about so many difficult life circumstances. 
We go back to Proverbs 25, 28. Like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks self-control. You know, in the days of Solomon, national security for a city was based on the walls, the, the strong walls that were around the city. And if those walls were broken, if those walls became damaged, then basically the residents inside that city, they became, well, sitting ducks, if you will, for all of their enemies. And so the parallel that we see here in this verse then is that you and I, when we lack self-control, when we don't have this protective wall of self-control around us, then we too, we're sitting ducks. But not to any other enemy, we're sitting ducks to ourselves. Because as I stated before, we are our own worst enemy. When there is no self-control, then decisions will be made in the heat of the moment rather than what we know, what the Spirit knows is best for us. As Solomon paints this picture of a, a city whose walls are broken down, uh, of an individual whose self-control is not there, the picture that is painted for us is quite clear that this is a very dangerous situation for one to be in. You say dangerous. I mean, come on now, how can, how can a lack of, of self-control, how can that really be, be dangerous? Well... For many of us, a lack of self-control has caused us to find ourselves in a financial mess, a financial mess that we never intended to be in, a financial mess that, that we don't want to be in. I mean, we've read all Dave Ramsey's books, we've listened to him on the radio, we've written our budget out on paper, we've done all those things that, that we think we're supposed to do. While we've even highlighted verses like Proverbs 22, there in verse 7, the rich roll, over, rich roll over the poor, the borrower's servant to the lender. But this morning we find ourselves in a greater financial mess than what we've ever been in before. We're overwhelmed. We're afraid. We really don't know what's going to happen next. We don't know how we got here. Dave Ramsey. Budgets on paper. Those things are good. Those things are practical. Those things can be helpful. But those things in and of themselves make for very flimsy walls. When we see something that we want to buy, we see something that we want to purchase that we just can't live without, <laughs> and suddenly, suddenly the advice of Dave Ramsey and so many others goes right out the window. We must have self-control. For if we don't, we will continue to make and maintain decisions that will we'll find ourselves continually living in this financial crisis. Some of us find ourselves in physical mess. We don't want to be here. But it's where we are. Maybe we, we weigh more than what we've ever weighed. Maybe we we feel worse than we've ever felt. I mean, listen, we've, we've tried, right? I mean, we've tried the Atkins diet. We've, we've tried the grapefruit diet. We've tried all those things. We've joined gyms. We, we've bought exercise equipment for the house. We, we've underlined passages like Proverbs 23, there verses 1 and 2, when you sit down to, to dine with a ruler. Note well what is before you. Put a knife to your throat if you're given to gluttony. But again... As we sit here today, we wait more, we feel worse, and we say, how did we get here? What happened? Well, it's simple, really. You see, all, all the diet plans and all the exercise equipment, which really amounts to nothing more than a glorified coat rack in our homes, it makes for a very, very flimsy wall when we're telling ourselves we're hungry. Maybe for some, it's the lack of self-control comes more in relationships. You find yourself in a relationship mess you don't want to be, you don't mean to be. You've read all the books, all those marriage books. Man, you've read them. You, you listen to a, a Dr. Phil. You, you pay attention to what he says, but, but you still find yourself in a mess relationship-wise. Well, while you've underlined verses like Proverbs 14 and verse 17, a, a quick-tempered man does foolish things, a crafty man is hated. But this morning, 
morning as you sit here, you know the truth. While your family may look good on the outside looking in, you, you know that as y'all walked in the church building this morning, everybody assumes everything's fine, but you know the truth of the matter. You know the truth of the matter is you're sitting next to someone who, frankly, they don't like you. You're sitting next to a spouse who won't talk to you. You got children. You have children who they don't want to have much of anything to do with you. And you say, now how did all this happen? How did all this come to be? Because all the seminars, all the books, all the Dr. Phil's, Dr. Laura's, whomever it might be that we want to listen to, they all make for very, very flimsy walls. And we find that we just can't control our temper. And if we don't find some self-control in this issue, then we will find that our relationships continue to suffer. Not just with family, but with friends. Solomon uses an image of a city. A city with broken down walls, and he shows us how this lack of self-control can be a very dangerous thing. But we also see that this can be a, a disgraceful thing. For you see, a, a broken down wall is a reflection of reputation. I think this is one of the things that probably motivated uh, Jer or Nehemiah to rebuild those walls. You see Nehemiah 1 and verse 3 there on the screen behind me. They said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down, its gates burned with fire. Surely of all the things that would motivate us to begin to build or rebuild this wall of self-control, surely it would bring the disgrace that can come as a result of not having control. But too often, too often we've turned our lack of control, of self-control in any given area, we've turned it into a joke so that it can help us cope with it a little bit better. We say, man, listen, did, did you see how, how upset I got the other night at that ball game? Did you see the way I was hollering and screaming at the referee and carrying on? I guess, I, you know, I just couldn't help it. Man, did you, did you see? Were you there the other night when I got so drunk? Tell you the truth, I don't even remember what all I did. And we laughed. We want to think that it's funny, but it's not. It's not a joke. It's not funny. How will we ever be able to help those around us when we cannot help ourselves? If we want to live this life in victory, not defeat, if we want to live this life in honor and not shame, then we will heed the words of Solomon. We will heed the words that we see throughout Proverbs. Proverbs 16, verse 32 tells us, He who is slow to anger is better than the city, and he who rules his spirit than he who captures a city. You know, in the days of Solomon, a warrior, a military warrior, was held in high regard. He was held in high esteem. People wanted to know what he had to say. He was very influential. People cared about his opinion. And oftentimes, as a result of his military might, he had become a, a very wealthy man, accumulating many material things. <clears throat> so Solomon takes this knowledge. He takes this knowledge and he says, listen, you want to know how to even be better than that? <laughs> you want to know how to be even more successful than that? You learn how to conquer yourself. If you can conquer yourself, the riches that will come with that, the blessings that will come with that, will far outweigh any of the riches or the wealth of this world. See, if you can conquer self, you can find peace. If you can begin to conquer self, you can find fewer regrets. If you can begin to conquer self, you can find better relationships. If you can begin to conquer self, you can even find spiritual maturity. In 2 Peter chapter 1, we read there beginning in verse 5, Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. 
For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here, Peter lays this foundation for us and says, listen, self-control, well, self-control is, is right at the heart of, of being and having this life that, that God wants you to have. And being the man or the woman that, that God wants you to be. Building self-control, the walls of self-control. It's not easy. Conquering desire, overcoming emotion is challenging. It's no easy task. It's not something that one should just take lightly. For you see, building the wall of self-control, it can be painful. It can be exhausting. At times, it can even be humiliating. And there is a temptation, a very real temptation to say, you know what? Why bother? I quit. I I'm not even going to try. Because anything that's this hard... <laughs> It's not even worth it. But before we throw in the towel, before we give up, I want to share with you a life that had an area of it that was very much out of control. You see, it's the very one that we've been referencing for the past three weeks. Solomon himself. I mean, here is Solomon, the man that, that God blessed with this wisdom that we are learning so much from. This man who, who seemingly had his act together. This man had an area of his life that was out of control. This man had a, a weak spot, if you will. You remember what it was, don't you? It was women. That's right. God had, had told Solomon, you don't go and get foreign women. Oh, poor Solomon. I, I guess he just couldn't help it. So he ended up with 700 wives, 300 concubines. Solomon loved the ladies, man. He just couldn't help it, Lord. No, he chose not to help it. He did not help it. And what was the end result of his choice? So the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this, and you've not kept my covenant, my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Let's pause there. Basically, Solomon made a trade. He's trading his kingdom for sex. What will we trade? You see, there's going to be a trade when it comes to this lack of self-control. Whatever this area is that's spinning out of control for you or for me, what will the trade be? Will it be our job? Will it be our reputation? Will it be relationships? Will it be health? What will the trade be? Because there's going to be a trade-off. Well, let's keep reading. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Let's stop there. Here's something very scary to think about. What will it cost your kids? What will it cost your grandkids? Whatever this area of your life is that's out of control, what's it going to cost them? What emotional pain or trauma or turmoil is it going to expose them to? What is it that they're going to have to deal with? Because you and I couldn't get control over whatever the area is of our life that we say we can't get control over. You don't want that for them, do you? Of course you don't. So if you don't want that for them, if I don't want that for David, then what will we do? How can we go about building this wall? First step is this. Give up control. You see, one of the reasons that so many of us, so many of us have an area of our life that is spinning out of control is because we've decided that all we have to do is just try a little bit harder and if we'll just simply try a little bit harder, then everything will work out. But inevitably, what have we found time and time again? Man, our flesh seems so much stronger than our spirit. 
And even though we try and we try harder, it seems like the flesh just gets stronger and stronger. And so we find ourselves throwing our hands up in the air saying, why can't I stop? That's the right answer. That's the right question to be asking. I can't stop. You, on your own, cannot stop. But here's the good news this morning. There is someone, there is someone who can help us find control. There is someone who can help us overcome whatever area of life it might be that is spinning so out of control. You know who that is. You wouldn't be here this morning if you didn't. Galatians chapter 5, Paul wrote in verse 16, I say walk by the Spirit and you'll not carry out the desires of the flesh. How did Jesus do it? You know, in Hebrews 4 verse 15, it, it tells us that he was tempted in all ways as we are yet without sin. So how did he do that? How was he tempted in all ways as you and I, yet he did not sin? He didn't give in. He never gave in to lust, to power, to materialism, or whatever it might have been that was put before him. He never gave in. So how? He surrendered his will to the will of the Father. Completely, totally, without question. It was not about what he wanted, but rather what about God wanted and expected from him. God wants to help us. He wants to help us see through the lies of the devil that, that we hear every day as he does throw those temptations our way. He, he wants to help us hear through that lie of the devil as it says, listen, I, I know you've had a bad day. If you'll just eat this, it'll make you feel a whole lot better. He wants us to see through that lie that says, listen, I know it's been a horrible week at work. If you'll just go buy this, you'll feel so much better. You'll feel better about yourself. You'll feel better about... The... He, he wants to help you see through that lie when in the heat of the moment, words are being exchanged, things are being said to you, and your mind's spinning about all the things that you're about to say back. He wants you to hear through that lie of the devil when the devil says, listen, you say what's on your heart. You say what you need to say. You say what you want to say. You'll feel better. You see, God wants to help us see through these lies. And so, so many more. God would say to us, listen, when nobody's home, don't, don't even turn on the computer. And we say, Lord, Lord, I'm just going to get on Facebook for a few minutes. I'm just going to see what everybody's up to. <clears throat> Next thing we know, we've idly wasted hours upon end. We say, Lord, I I'm just going to check out the, the scores. I'm going to check out things, see how the Olympics are going, you know. And before we know it, we find ourselves swimming in pornography. God would say, listen, don't even bother going to the mall today. We'd say, Lord, listen, I'm just going to go look. I just want to go see. And three or four hours later, we walk out of the mall with our arms filled with packages and eight to ten credit card receipts in our pocket that we did not need. The Lord says, listen, don't, don't say what you're about to say. And we say, come on, Lord, they know I'm kidding. And just a few seconds later, we realize how deeply our words hurt somebody that we love. If we want to gain control, then we must give up control. If we want to gain self-control in our life over whatever the area might be, then we need to allow God to guide us. You know, <clears throat> this is a very short song in our book. It's a beautiful song. It's actually a prayer it's so one of my favorite songs. It's a song that recently I found myself, well, singing quite often. I want to share it with you today. I'm sure many of you know it. I'd ask that you just sing with me. <coughs> my heart, my mind, my body, my soul. i 
give up. We have to give that, that sense of control over to our God and allow Him to guide us. Secondly is this, we need to refuse to be soft. I think one of the reasons that so many of us have an area of our life that is spinning out of control is because ultimately we're just big babies. <laughs> I mean, that's really what it boils down to. We will whine and we will cry and we will go on about how hard it is. But really, what else do we expect? I mean, do we expect it to come easily to us? I mean, our flesh, our flesh has, has been and running wide open for years. What makes us think that it's just going to very easily, naturally be able to, to rein back in? No, just coming to the occasional worship service is not going to be enough in and of itself to help us get this control. I want to share with you what the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, there beginning in verse 26. Therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I buffet my body and make it my slave, lest possibly after I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. This is not the picture of someone who limits their time in worship to God to just a couple times a week, maybe the occasional Bible class. This is not the picture of an individual who limits their time in prayer to God to simply mealtime and maybe occasionally bedtime. This is a picture of someone who is completely investing themselves back into their spiritual life. The Apostle Paul was not soft, but many of us are. Many of us are extremely soft. We get bored when the prayer goes too long. We start fidgeting and, and looking at our watches whenever the sermon passes 1130. There's no way. No way we turn off our favorite television show to spend more time with God and His Word. It's no wonder. It's no wonder that our flesh leads us around like a dog on a leash. It takes time and effort to build the wall. It's time to stop being soft. Third and finally, lessons yours. Cross your heart. Now, I'm not talking about that, that simple promise that we oftentimes made as children. I cross my heart. No, listen, we know how easy it is to break those very shallow promises. But what I am talking about, what I am referring to is that the cross of Christ, that it would be central in our lives. That the cross of Christ, that it would be central in all areas, in all matters where we make these decisions each and every day. If you have your Bibles, turn with me over to Titus chapter 2. In Titus 2, I'm going to be reading beginning in verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desire, to live sensibly, righteously, godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. The cross of Jesus Christ is not just about our salvation. The cross of Jesus Christ is also about our transformation. And our transformation comes as a result of the choices that we make. We see in Proverbs chapter 4 there in verse 23, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Do you want to know the best way to guard your heart? It's to take up the cross of Christ daily. As we take up the cross of Christ daily, as we put the cross of Christ in our heart, in our lives, then suddenly there's not nearly as much room for the lust and the greed and the, the materialism and, and all the other fleshly desires all those other fleshly desires that have consumed so many, causing some area of our life to be completely, totally out of control. This morning, 
this morning. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, there is no better time to do so than today. Through your belief that He is the Son, the Christ, you can repent of your past sins, repenting of who you have been, looking to who you can become in Christ. You can confess that sweet belief that He truly is the Christ, the Son of God. You can be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Coming up out of the watery grave of baptism, knowing, knowing that your past, knowing that your sins, knowing they've been washed away by the blood of Jesus, knowing that you've been added to His body, knowing that you have been forgiven and that you have clothed yourself with Christ. Oh, knowing, knowing that now you're going to do your very best to live faithful. Children of God, I want to talk to you for just a moment. Is there an area of your life that's out of control? Is there an area of your life where the things that we've talked about this morning, maybe it's been hard for you to really focus into everything that's been said because your heart and your mind have been, have been turning, you've been reflecting, you've been thinking about that one area, you know what it is. It could be that only you and the Lord himself know, but you know. If it's something that you would like for us to pray with you or for you about today, we would be honored to do just that. If you are ready to give your life to the Lord, to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, the water is ready and prepared, if you are. If we can help you in any way to live for Jesus, won't you come as we stand and sing together?